Today we're going to be reviewing the latest game by From Software. Wait, what? It's not made by From Software. Who's Neo is? Otherwise, it look and play exactly like it. Wait, how could they? How could they possibly? I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. Oh my God. Okay, hold on. Let me let me just compose myself for a little bit. <clears throat> okay. Woo! For the longest time, From Software has been on its own pedestal when it comes to Souls games, and no matter how many developers try to emulate their success and release their own Souls likes, none have been able to replicate From success. In fact, I would argue that none of them have even come close to achieving the magic that the Souls series reaches on a consistent basis. The overall package of level and enemy design, atmosphere, world building, cryptic but enchanting storytelling, and of course, boss fights, has been unmatched by anything from other developers. If one game has great gameplay, they lack in story. Or if they have a cool world design, it's held back by inconsistent performance. The point is, nothing has been on the level of From Software games since their first foray into the Souls genre. And then Lies of P showed up. What was that list that I had in my last review? Can we, can we roll that back, please? Hi-Fi Rush, Hogwarts Legacy, Dead Space Remake, Resident Evil 4 Remake, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, not the PC port, Tears of the Kingdom, Final Fantasy 16, Baldur's Gate 3, Armored Core 6, Fires of Rubicon. We have another. I'm just gonna come right out and say it. Lies of P is the best Souls-like I've ever played. It's got flaws, and we'll get into that later, but this is the first Souls-like that has ever been able to capture that Souls magic. Almost to a T. If I knew absolutely nothing about this game, and you sat me down, handed it to me and said, here's from software's newest game, and I played it for about 30 minutes, I'd be like, wow, once again, another good from software launch. I would believe you. That's how good this game is. I want you all to listen to me right now. Everyone watching this video, if you have not played Lies of P or are on the fence about playing this game, I am on my knees right now begging you, go play this game. It is free on Game Pass. Go download it right now. You have nothing to lose. If you're on PlayStation, pay the money. It's worth it. There should be no attitude out there that this is just another Souls ripoff. No, this is not. This is much, much more than that. I know this year has been packed, stacked, and ready to attack, but trust me, if you skip over this game, you are missing out. <laughs> All right, now that I'm done simping for the game, why am I simping for the game? Well, that's what we're here to talk about, aren't we? So strap in, boys and girls, and let's get down to business. Lies of P is the first Souls-like developed by NeoWiz, who developed games like... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got nothing. And this is the dark retelling of the classic story of Pinocchio. Yes, you heard that right. Pinocchio. The game director Choi Ji Wan took one look at this... And he said what we were all thinking. This would make a great Souls-like, wouldn't it? <laughs> the story takes place in the city of Krat, a place billed as the city of tomorrow due to its technological advancements and, most groundbreaking, the creation of puppets, who act as servants, entertainment, and, sometimes, love interests. Man, if only Garman knew about this place, he wouldn't have had to sell his soul in order to get his doll to come back to life. He could have just placed an order. But one day, all the puppets go insane and turn against the city killing all humans in sight and turning Krat from a futuristic utopia into a hellish nightmare. But an ironic twist of fate, the last hope for Krat is none other than a puppet. The puppet. Geppetto's puppet. Take a shot every time I say puppet. You awaken in a train, woken up by a mysterious blue butterfly, and start your journey to quell the puppet frenzy. You know what that means. It's steampunk time! The concept of seeing how Pinocchio is handled in this type of setting should be enough to hook you, but if that's not enough, you're instantly thrown into an abandoned train station with rogue puppets and you instantly realize, all right, this place has truly gone to shit. Let's explore it. Before we talk gameplay, we have got to mention the setting and atmosphere. The scenery of Krat is just breathtaking. It truly looks, and more importantly, feels like a haunted, desolate city. You got tons of bloody corpses lying around, destroyed carriages and blockades, distorted PA announcements and static warnings, and, oh yeah, tons of patrolling, bloodthirsty puppets. Along with some foreshadowing for much later. On the Series X, the graphics look beautiful. 
Yet another example that not every game has to have lifelike graphics, just a gorgeous art style. Speaking of gorgeous, we arrive at our hub area, Hotel Krat, and this place is stunning. Like, you actually just stepped into the lobby of a wizard hotel. The giant stargazer in the middle does a lot to help out with that. But the lighting of the hotel and the aesthetic of the walls and portraits? I'm no interior designer, but that looked good! This extends to the rest of the areas, as each paints a picture that feels like Krat is a haunted shadow of its former self. Will someone please turn that damn song off? The sound design is also pristine. The sound the puppets make, this disturbed mechanical howl. Nothing I tell you in this video is gonna do it justice. You have to play it and experience it for yourself. But enough about aesthetic, I wasted enough of your time already. We all know you're here for one reason. How does Liza P play? So let's talk gameplay. You probably heard this said about Liza P multiple times. The best way I can describe the gameplay is Bloodborne meets Sekiro. And if you played a From Software game, this should feel very familiar to you, even down to the way the enemies react and fall down once you kill them. Now, I've heard many people say that this is too similar to Bloodborne, almost to the point of straight up copying. And to those people, I would ask this. Do you like the formula? Did you have fun playing the formula? Did you look forward to the formula? Then we're using the formula! Now, obviously you have to change up the formula a little bit to avoid straight up plagiarism and carve out your own identity, and I feel like Liza P does that very well, without straying from the systems that everyone knows and loves. The weapon system is the most unique mechanic brought to the table. Excluding boss weapons, each weapon is divided into two parts. The blade, and the handle. The blade determines how much damage you do, while the handle determines the way you wield it. And you have the very unique option to mix and match whatever parts you see fit with any weapon you want. Because I know what you're thinking. This is a comically small blade to fight giant machines with, so let's find a better solution. You want to put great swords on a regular sword hilt? Go ahead. You want to put a giant puppet axe on a great sword hilt? Go ahead. Go right ahead. You won't be able to see anything though. You like this cool looking charge attack but don't want to spend the resources to upgrade again? Just Put the hilt on the blade you're already using. This creates so many different opportunities to mix and match and get creative, like being able to stab someone with a hammerhead. You know, like that COD animation. This could get wild, but what Lies of P does to keep the system balanced is it speeds up or slows down your attack animation depending on what weapon you're using. So you can't wield a great sword at the same speed as a regular sword, but you still get the motion and abilities the handle gets. Each weapon comes with its own fable art, the equivalent of Ashes of War from Elden Ring. Each do different things, such as enhanced basic attacks or just simply calling down the wrath of God upon your enemies. Some fable attacks only require one bar of fable, while most boss weapons that I've seen require three, or in my case, all of them, because I never increased my fable art meters. In terms of combat mechanics, as I said, Liza P takes inspiration from Bloodborne and Sekiro. You get a sidestep dodge and an option to parry after performing a perfect guard, though the window for that is very, very small. Like, it seems smaller than in Sekiro, but maybe that's just me. It also introduces its own rally system, where, unlike Bloodborne, the only way you can get chip damage is by blocking and then you make up the health you lost by attacking and performing perfect guards. I gotta say, I kinda like this spin on the rallying mechanic, so it's not just a straight up copy of Bloodborne, and you actually have choices when approaching your defensive maneuvers. Though this game encourages aggression, as not only with the rally mechanic, but the enemies will also slowly regain their health from the chip damage if you let them live for too long. Now, this is usually so slow it's unrecognizable, but it can compile if you're not on top of things, or if you're in a boss fight and haven't attacked for a while because you're looking for an opening, you can completely forget about it and look down and realize, wait a minute, he didn't have that much health earlier. The only way to fully get rid of chip damage in Liza P is the game's most unique combat mechanic, fatal attacks. Now, you might be asking, but every Souls game has a fatal attack or a visceral attack. How is this different? The difference is, once you break an enemy's posture, their health bar will start glowing white, and to fully knock them down, you need to perform a charged heavy attack. Then you can do your fatal attack and inflict high damage. 
So there's a two-step process for this instead of just being able to do it once they're staggered, like in other games. Some people might think this is unnecessary, but I think it's a cool spin on the mechanic, where knocking down the enemy turns into a risk-reward situation. Do you want to take a chance and risk getting pummeled, or do you hang back and just keep playing out the way they are? It adds another layer of depth to the combat, and at least for me, it's more than welcome. All of this I just talked about without mentioning one of Lies of P's best features, the Legion Arm. This game's version of the Shinobi prosthetic from Sekiro, and I'm gonna be honest, I think the Legion Arm is better than the Shinobi prosthetic. I never really found myself using the prosthetic in Sekiro aside from maybe the firecrackers every now and then, but the Legion Arm has way more useful features that I was using consistently throughout the game. You have a grappling hook that can pull enemies closer to you, turning you into Scorpion. You have a short range electric blast that's super effective against puppets. You can have a flamethrower that has some pretty good range and is great for pretty much free damage. You have a shield that explodes when enemies hit it. Someone was watching that donkey video. You could put down mines. My god, this thing is massive. How is he holding this up? We might have a problem getting this through airport security. You can throw acid at puppets for decay buildup, and oh yeah, we got a grenade launcher. Oh crap, did I leave my stove on? Using the Legion arm is just plain fun, and that's all that needs to be said. Overall, the gameplay is a blast, just like any Souls-like should be, but it is elevated by taking the more popular mechanics and other well-known Souls games while adding its own unique ideas, all of which are executed to a near-perfect degree. Let's talk level design. Every good Souls game needs it, and Eliza P has it. It pulls off the same technique that Bloodborne did, where even though the city aesthetic is consistent throughout, they each find a way to stand out and be unique, without having separate biomes. And like any good Souls-like, it makes extensive use of shortcuts and interconnected pathways. Speaking of interconnected, let's talk Hotel Krat. I brought this up earlier, but now we're getting fully into it. This place, honestly, is one of my favorite hub areas ever. The amount of features available to you, leveling up, upgrading your weapon, upgrading your legion arm, buying upgrade materials, decoding treasure maps, and eventually buying boss weapons, and an actual training area. Yes, thank you. The NPCs at the hotel are also interesting to talk to and have backstories, but what sets it apart is the interconnectivity. This is honestly the most interconnected hub world I've seen since Firelink Shrine, the reason I don't bring up Majula is because this was more of a set area that had multiple branching paths without anything looping back into it. The past few Souls games, the hub worlds have just been separate areas disconnected from the rest of the worlds, which, for established reasons of course, but Hotel Krat connects to five different areas of the game. Krat Central Station Plaza, Elysian Boulevard, the Malum District, Rosa Isabel Street, and the Relic of Trismegistus. If you're like me, upon finding the gold coin fruit tree and you hear the hotel theme playing, oh, that feels so good. Especially after hearing so much about it throughout the game and discovering it's in your very own safe haven. Some other notable levels I want to discuss are, first up, the Estrella Opera House. This is a hauntingly beautiful level, with a creepy choir playing in the background. I originally hated the enemies in the area, but the latest patch nerfed the spider lady's health, so it is now much more enjoyable. The juxtaposition of a gorgeous high-end gala with all the blood stains lying around is something I will never get tired of. Just before that, Rosa Isabel Street is the entertainment district that, much like the rest of the city, has been completely destroyed. Uh, hey buddy, I, I, I think that's burned enough. <laughs> You got soldier puppets with rifles and flamethrowers, XQC's maids, and oh yeah, suicide bombers. All this time in the background, you got this old French song playing on speakers, which was also the trailer music by the way. And oh yeah, Pennywise is back and uh, he, he ate all the kids from Derry. <laughs> Another one, the Isle of Alchemists, implements something initially seen in the Barren Swamp where there are a lot of stronger monsters patrolling the area, but you will also be bombarded with cannon fire. Now, this sounds like bullshit, yes? Well, you also find out that there's friendly fire, so just position yourself and lure them in. That feels good, doesn't it? Also, I touched on it a little bit, but this soundtrack, this music is good. Like, really, really good. 
Like, Choi Ji Won just came in and said, if I don't have choir in every one of these songs, none of you are getting your breast milk. Oh, sorry, wrong developer. But this is a Souls-like, so... You know what we gotta talk next. The boss, baby. Say hello to Liza P's boss lineup, also known as Spirit Airlines. I call it that because everything's always delayed, and they can cancel on you without telling. I came out of my first playthrough with one opinion. Jesus, these bosses are brutal. I mean, towards the end, I was like, oh my god. Please let this be a normal boss fight. With a friend? No way! No However, everything changed once I saw IGN's review of the game, and the author says that playing Motivity, this game's version of strength, you can simply smack down bosses with your heavy weapons that do enormous stagger damage. I kind of wish I could just skip it and get to the part that's actually fun and challenging. Many fights felt like they put the first phase there just as a warm-up round before getting to the actual meat of the encounter. So this tells me one of two things. Either Motivity is the most broken stat in all the video games, or I have to go bathe in holy water for about three days straight for committing the cardinal sin of having a harder time on a Souls boss than an IGN journalist! So I made a commitment. I would do my second playthrough focusing entirely on motivity and letting technique rot in the barren swamp. A few moments later. I mean, it's alright! Okay, maybe I'll just bathe for two hours. That's more time than an average gamer does in a year anyway. <laughs> now, I thought long and hard about this, and I've come to this conclusion. Are the boss fights in Lies of P good? Yes and no. Uh huh? Allow me to explain. I had fun fighting a majority of the bosses in Lies of P, but by the end of the game, I started to notice that almost every boss has or heavily relies on delayed attacks, and some just switch up the speed on you. Now, this is fine for a handful of bosses, but when this many are using delayed attacks as their main form of difficulty, it starts to expose the underlying issue with the fights itself. But like I said, I had a fun fight, uh, I had a fun time with the majority of the bosses, and these primarily were at the beginning and first half of the mid-game. I first want to highlight the two that I would actually consider quote-unquote S-tier bosses. First up, the one I think is the best boss in the entire game. The King of Puppets is a gigantic puppet mastermind that will make you bend the damn knee whether you like it or not. His arena is probably the best looking in the game. This giant opera auditorium with tables everywhere, none of which survive. His theme is amazing, evoking this kind of sad, almost heartbroken feel to it. I mean, I would expect that from a song called Stage of Grief. You find that out much later. In terms of the fight, this guy is the ultimate balance of difficulty and fairness, because he has access to a frankly disturbing amount of moves, half of them which come complete with Slave Knight Gale's double slash in the form of his pipe arms. But once you start to learn the many sequences of his moveset, you have a clear path to victory but you still have to whittle him down, and that's easier said than done because he is an absolute unit. If you get killed by him, he just takes off his crown and shakes his head in disappointment. <laughs> just like your mom. <laughs> if that wasn't enough, his second phase reveals that the man underneath the suit is literally just riding, and the fight just turns into a breakneck duel. The entire boss fight is just so exhilarating. The second one is the true final boss in the game, the Nameless Puppet. And to avoid stumbling into spoilers, I'll just put the fight like this. The first phase is a duel straight out of Sekiro, and the second phase is straight up Lady Maria. That's all I'll say. Go play it. Aside from those two, every other boss ranged from pretty good to bad. But the game starts off strong. The Parade Master is a great tutorial boss, introducing you to the basics of boss mechanics and relieving head trauma. The Mad Donkey isn't really challenging, but does a good job of introducing mini boss fights with NPCs since you'll encounter a lot of these with other stalkers throughout the game. The Scrapped Watchman is a fast-paced dodge fest that speeds up his attacks in the second phase with the sight of lightning. This is where we see the first delayed switch up with his wind-up swipe, but here it can be forgiven because it's one move and you can figure out the speed by watching how fast he winds up. You figure it out after a while. Jeff Bezos is a fun fight- <clears throat> sorry. King's Flame Fuoco is a fun fight against a literal blast furnace, minus the kick that has the same animation as a sideswipe. And the second phase is just... Uh... SIR, THERE'S KIDS WATCHING THIS! I will say, he had one weird hitbox with his slam move, but I never had that problem since, so... Don't really know what to say about that. Fallen Archbishop Andreas is a pretty cool first phase with a really disgusting design, but the second phase... It's bad. It's just bad. It turned into a duo fight. 
Fallen Archbishop Andreas and the camera. I know you can run around to the back to face his regular form, but he'll take measures to make sure you don't. The Black Rabbit Brotherhood. I don't hate this fight. Wait, what? The fight looks like it's going to be a gang fight, but it turns into a multi-duo fight where the eldest is the main boss, but each other member comes in to assist. And when they're both in, the other members come after the player while the eldest hangs back and every now and then charges the player. Great. This creates a separation that is critical for fights like this to work, and the arena's big enough where you don't have to worry about triggering both because of the lack of space. In terms of the Eldest, this guy's combos go on forever, my god. This is another underlying issue with the overall boss fights in the game, where the animations sometimes aren't as clear on whether something is done or if it transitions into another combo, and I got burned multiple times, but maybe that's just me. Once you figure it out, like most of them, it becomes clear. Champion Victor is a great boss that's not as challenging, but he's a great and welcome change of pace after you most likely have been getting curb stomped for the past few hours, and it's a good thing this is Spirit Airlines because I was able to sneak this past airport security. After that, big drop off. The green monster of the swamp is just meh. The Walker of Illusions is just a larger version of a knife wielding puppet. The Corrupted Prayed Master is just a reskin. I know the moveset is a little different, but it's still a reskin. The Black Rabbit Brotherhood Round 2 turned into exactly what I was afraid the first one would be. Door Guardian is a gimmick boss. No reason this guy doles out shock damage aside from they needed a way to make the fight challenging. <sighs> Luxasia. Oh boy. Now, I needed three playthroughs to actually figure out whether this was a good boss, and at the end of it, I would consider her a fair and balanced fight with absolutely excellent presentation. But I might... No. Actually, I know this is gonna get hate. I don't like this fight. Like I said, it's fair and balanced, but almost her entire first phase moveset is delayed attacks. Like I said earlier, having delayed attacks in your arsenal is not bad. Look at many bosses in Elden Ring. But Luxasia takes this concept to an absurd degree, where almost every single one she's doling out is a delayed attack, and at that point, it just becomes a slog to play through. Even when you have figured out the timing, the fight goes from a dance to a guessing game. And while you can decipher and figure out the timing on most of them, in my opinion, this doesn't make the fight better, it just makes it more annoying. Also, there's two attacks in particular that switch the speed up on you, which is just another cheap trick. Her second phase is just like, oh, you don't like delayed attacks. All right, everything's coming out immediately. Psych, I lied. Um, are you gonna come down? I feel like the second phase is a little better, but there needs to be a better telegraph on the lightning dive. Overall, through three playthroughs, even though my feelings changed on the mechanics, if I was making a tier list, I would be willing to put Luxasia as an A tier, but I am not willing to give her an S tier, because through three playthroughs, I never once had fun fighting her. Here's another hot take, maybe. I don't like the Simon Manus fight either. I know he's got some fans and he's built up over the course of the endgame, but I generally don't like my final boss fights being reduced to my uncle's drunken stupor on a Saturday night. The moveset is not interesting or engaging, the animations are not crisp, the camera isn't zoomed out enough to read his overhead consistently, the second phase is more of the same with some projectiles added in, the giant hand of god attack is pretty cool, but as the penultimate boss in the game and for some, the final boss, this was a giant letdown. And then of course you have the nameless puppet. Despite the fun I had on the early bosses, these two made me look back on the other fights and question whether or not they were actually well executed in their design because these mechanics and gimmicks that were present in some form for the other fights were exacerbated in the last two. If a boss fight prompts me to do that, that's a problem. Again, I have to point this out because Neil Wiz showed me that with the King of Puppets and the Nameless Puppet, they are capable of making a challenging but fair and fun boss fight on the level of something made by From Software. And pointing out these problems is critical for them to improve on this. Otherwise, you'll just continue to get mediocre boss fights. And I think I speak for everyone watching this that we would love to see NeoWiz succeed after this installment. Again, a lot of this just comes from inexperience. This is their first attempt at making a Souls-like. I'm not expecting something at the level of Radon on a consistent basis. But ironing out these problems will make your boss fights and your game better. And I feel like it would be irresponsible of me to just simply gloss over it and just 
straight up overlook this. Okay, now we're back to the good stuff. Remember, despite everything I've said, this is a Pinocchio story, and you've seen the title of the game. So you know what concept we're going to explore. Lying. And the concept of obtaining your humanity. All puppets are connected through the laws of their primary programming, known as the Grand Covenant. The first law being that a puppet cannot lie. But you're not bound by the Grand Covenant, so you can do whatever you want. The game, however, consistently hammers home the point that lying is a good thing, because every time you lie, you gain more humanity. Because you don't want to be a puppet, you want to be a real boy. Puppets are bad, and you believe it because... Well, let's just say there's a lot of evidence. You can't even get into Hotel Crot without telling a lie due to its puppet defenses. The game tells the player early on that lying is the right choice to make. Say something crazy like I'm wearing ladies' underwear. I'm, I, uh, I'm wearing ladies' underwear. Are you? I most certainly am not! But as you progress through the game, you're faced with more complex situations and your own moral compass kicks in. Yeah, you can lie to the woman and trick her into believing this baby puppet is really her child. Because why do I care about lying to her? I don't know this woman. I don't have any attachment to her. But what about the people at Hotel Crot that you do get attached to? For instance, if you've been following Eugenie's side quest, you're learning about her backstory with her idol, and once you find out the truth, you have the option of whether or not to tell her. And you could lie and gain more humanity, but... This woman has been upgrading your weapons all game, and she's chosen to confide in you, so... Yeah, I feel like Eugenie deserves to know about this. Other times, like when you tell Belle the truth and give the full description of what happened to our partner, she gets mad and doesn't talk to you for the rest of the game. How about when you're working with Vanini to uncover the truth about the puppet frenzy, and you finally get the key message where only you can decipher it. You're given the choice to either tell him the true culprit, or withhold it which is a matter that you DEFINITELY SHOULD BE TELLING HIM ABOUT. Yeah, you can lie in every one of these instances to gain humanity, but how does that affect everyone around you? How does that affect you personally? How do you feel about the decision you made? Because you're gonna have to live with whatever you say for the rest of the game. You can choose to blindly lie throughout your playthrough. After all, the game is constantly enforcing the idea that it is the right thing to do. But doing that is no different than a puppet telling the truth in accordance with the programming of the Grand Covenant. Because after all, making your own decisions is the most human thing of all. We are loyal soldiers. We follow orders, but we are not a bunch of unthinking droids. We are men. We must be trusted to make the right decisions, especially when the orders we are given are wrong. Lies of P executes on this concept flawlessly, and through your own actions, you can pave your own way to truly becoming a real boy. What if I told you the best thing about Lies of P was not its gameplay, not its mechanics, not its bosses, not even its level design. What if I told you it was the story? You pick your jaw up off the floor yet? Now I'm going to be getting into spoilers here, so everyone that hasn't played, just letting you know that you should play and experience it if you haven't, but if you're still interested in hearing the rest, skip to this timestamp. Alright, let's roll. The story of the game is more forthcoming, but it's still shown to you rather than having everything placed in front of you. This is demonstrated no better than the excellent opening cutscene, where you get the full picture of the creation of the puppets, what Krat was like in its prime, and how the puppets went mad. And the soundtrack does a, does a great job of adding weight to what you're being shown to an absolutely insane degree. I'm not going to play the song here and risk any copyright, but go watch the opening cutscene and listen to that beat switch up. By the end of the cutscene, you're like, yeah, we got a massive problem on our hands. You wake up in a train and are quickly introduced to your guide, Jiminy Cricket. Our first objective is to get Jiminy to quit smoking. We make our way to Hotel Crot, find out that Geppetto hasn't come back yet, and set out to find him. Hey, let's be more careful. Hey, the Chantix worked. We make our way through Elysian Boulevard and get introduced to our father, Geppetto, who will be coming back to at the hotel, but you start to realize something's off here. What makes the story so engaging is the amount of layers to everything. And I don't just mean with lore. I mean with the way it's told through NPC stories and item descriptions. 
Putting the main plot aside for now, the best storytelling from Lies of P comes in the form of its NPC side quests, because every one of these characters you interact with has some form of depth to them, and their stories all take a turn where a lot of these just come straight out of left field. Aladora was the guy who sells you boss weapons, and he's regarded as sort of a folktale, including to Eugenie, who tells you that he saved her from a collapsing tower but lost his finger in the process. So she made him a glove that fits his hand, because obviously, the real Aladoro doesn't have a pinky. But when you give it to him, he's just disgusted by it. Which is weird to Eugenie that he didn't recognize it. Well, that's because this isn't the real Alidoro. This is his partner, who killed him because he wasn't a good businessman. Now this could have ended right then and there, and it would have been a good side quest, but then you learn that the real Alidoro was actually Eugenie's long-lost brother. That did not need to be there, but the developers were like, let's just throw a lore curveball here to make your blacksmith have more depth. Paul and Dina starts off as just the puppet clerk for the hotel, but he then starts to tell you he's developing feelings towards Antonia. And through this side quest, the game explores the idea that puppets can have some sort of feelings. When you acquire the potion to cure Antonia's petrification, you can give her the potion to cure her pain, but she still passes away. Paul and Dina gives one last thank you to the player, before pulling a near automata and deleting his memory. Throughout the game, you'll run into these payphones where you answer riddles from the king of riddles, Arlecchino. Depending on your answer, you're given a trinity key that unlocks special rooms with rare loot. It's a fun little detour listening to something straight out of Batman. Running parallel to this, you're consistently interacting with Venini and learning about his life story. And he tells you that he was the one that helped Geppetto implement the Grand Covenant to keep all puppets under control because his parents were killed by a puppet when he was a little boy. The puppet that killed them? Arlecchino. Who you meet towards the end of the game and... Yeah, this guy's a f psycho. They have locked us in the prison they call puppetry. I learned this truth long, long ago. That is why I've been exacting my revenge against them all ever since! Blood and revenge, revenge and blood, it's the only thing that truly drives me. <laughs> and it was so much fun! <laughs> Want another? Okay, here's one that nobody expected. Throughout the game, you're constantly hearing about the great singer Adelina Corday, who has an entire street seemingly dedicated to her. The white lady who you fight before the main avenue of Rosa Isabel Street was her sister, Patricia, who was also an opera singer who had to retire and become a stalker because a poison destroyed her singing voice. This told through the item description of her mask that you get when you kill her. Throughout the fight, she's constantly saying she's taken revenge on the puppets that killed her sister, but when you're at the Estrella Opera House, you find Adelita alive and well. Well, actually, not well. And it's a cool moment seeing an important figure described in the lore just sitting there, a, a shell of her former self, mumbling her songs since her voice was destroyed by the petrification disease. But when you give her an apple, uh, she says this. Patricia, I coveted your voice. If I can't match it, then even if I have to break you, Adelina Corday must have it all. Wait, did, did you just admit? Was I supposed to hear that? There's just so many layers, and we haven't even talked about the main plot yet. You make your way through Krat, cutting through puppets until you arrive at the transport leading to St. Frangelico Cathedral, where you're stopped by the Atones, who fights you to keep you from discovering what's up there. But it sounds like it's more to spare you from something. You'll soon find out. Falling down here is better than devouring terror above! So, what is so bad that you are trying to take my life to prevent me from experiencing it? Now, Krat, along with the Puppet Frenzy, is also dealing with an outbreak of what is known as the Petrification Disease. A sickness that rots the body from the inside and leads to the body being covered in stone scales. Similar to Grayscale in Game of Thrones. So when we go up here and... Wait a minute. What the hell? What the hell is that? Surprise! We got zombies now! 
you slowly start to unravel the mystery of the carcass monsters, which lead you to the alchemist and... Oh, hi, Kirk. You're introduced to Simon Manus as your main villain and someone who uses the petrification disease as a way to godhood. Oh boy, it's the healing church again. The alchemists, with help from the Black Rabbit Brotherhood, the Fox, the Cat, and Alidoro, eventually attack Hotel Krat and capture Geppetto, leaving the one place where you're free from harm ransacked. Um, hey guys, you, you know you can just clean this up, right? You don't... You don't have to leave stuff lying around like this. I, I'm, I'm out doing stuff. Oh, yeah. You want some more depth? All right. Your listener, Sophia, your maiden, the one that levels you up? Yeah, this isn't her real form, and her body is actually on the Isle of Alchemists, being experimented on to learn about Ergo and the Petrification Disease. And when we find her body... Oh, man, this is depressing. And just when you thought... There couldn't be more layers to this story. You're hit with the biggest twist in the entire game. As you've been working with Vanini to discover the truth about the puppet frenzy, you're finally able to decipher the Ergo wavelengths to discover a transmission from the King of Puppets, who reveals the true culprit. First law, all puppets must obey the creator's commands. Law zero. The creator's name is... Geppetto. Giuseppe Geppetto. This whole time, the man behind the puppet frenzy wasn't the king of puppets, it wasn't Simon Manus, it was your own father, the creator of the puppets. You are a puppet reincarnation of Geppetto's deceased son, Carlo, and the puppet frenzy was started so that your heart can accumulate the necessary strength and ergo to become powerful enough to bring Carlo back to life. Dear Lord. Oh yeah, and you know Romeo, the King of Puppets? He was Carlo's childhood best friend, who Carlo confided in because Geppetto never even cared about him when he was alive. So when he died, Geppetto essentially instigated a genocide all just to make up for a mistake he made. But then Romeo eventually took control of the situation and commanded the puppets to go after the carcass monsters and alchemists, and it's even inferred that they're back to protecting humans again. And you stroll right on in and kill your best friend under false pretenses, and before the fight even starts, the play that's going on stage is a foreshadowing of Geppetto's true plans for you! Holy sh! This is one of the best stories I've experienced this year, if not the best, and it's not even told in a traditional narrative format, and it is definitely top 5 stories in any Souls game I ever played. It's that good. Alright, okay, let me calm down. Alright, now that we have all the positives, with some caveats, now it's time to get into the flaws, because, like I said earlier, Lies of P is not a perfect game. Let's talk about it. The first and main thing I have to bring up is the movement in the beginning is very restrictive when it comes to dodging. This is because the abilities such as dodging in the middle of another dodge animation, you know, the key to dodge spamming, and rolling on the ground are locked behind skill upgrades. What? Why? Why? Tell me why. This critical feature, this basic mechanic that every Souls game has is restricted at the start for the first hour of gameplay. This is not an ability or anything like that. This is a function of combat that makes the movement feel smooth. And in terms of the roll mechanic, it's in the second skill phase, which you need to have two upgrades unlocked in the first phase in order to open up, which leads to bullshit combos from this guy. From what I played, this was the only enemy that was able to do this to me, but if that is able to happen with even one enemy type, that is an oversight. Problems with stuff like boss mechanics and enemy balancing can just be chalked up to inexperience. It, it's your first Souls-like, you haven't honed your craft this long. But for people who are inspired by Dark Souls and Bloodborne, I cannot think of why they thought this decision to have such critical features unavailable at the start of the game would make the game better. And you know what? They paid the price for it. I've seen people on Twitter who were turned off by the demo specifically because of the movement. And the crazy thing is, once you get the upgrades, movement is like a dream. That's on you. 
That is completely 100% on the developers. That should not have been able to take place. Now granted, this was the demo and things have much, much improved from the demo in terms of movement, but the dodging was still restricting. There shouldn't have been restrictions on the dodge in the first place. That's the problem. The only reason I can possibly think of that they decided on it was the story in terms of the story. Like you're a puppet and normal puppets are very robotic and unagile, but you're, you're different than them, but you're still a puppet and have limitations, but built differently. So as you get more ergo to loosen your springs and become more agile, leading to the ability to dodge more, I guess that was their thinking. But look at the mental gymnastics I had to do to get to that conclusion. Just have it at the start of the game. Another thing which I think might be worse because with the dodging, once you get the upgrades, it's fine. The game doesn't have poise. For those of you who don't know, poise is the ability to take damage while finishing your attack animation. This is critical for strength builds to work in Souls games. And Lies of P doesn't have it. There's some fable attacks that let you poise through things, but for the most part, if you get hit, you get staggered. This especially becomes a problem since you have to charge a heavy attack to fully knock an enemy down, which takes time to wind up, and the recovery time that enemies have is pretty fast, so you gotta time this window perfectly or else you're not hitting anything. It also makes great swords and other strength weapons less attractive despite the stagger doles out because the wind up is longer and you have no protection against a faster strike. I originally was gonna comment on some of the stronger enemies just being way too tanky. Like, there's no reason why some of these guys had this much health, but luckily Neo was agreed because they released the patch, like I mentioned earlier, that balanced out some of this stuff. I don't think they should have nerfed some of the bosses, I don't think that was the problem, but for the stronger enemies, this definitely needed to happen. I wouldn't really consider this part a flaw, but it definitely holds the game back from some of its contemporaries. The game is completely linear. There's like one secret area that I found throughout the game, but other than that, it is 100% linear, which works for Lies of P, honestly. But in the future, I would love to see some more secret areas and branching pathways now that NeoWiz has some experience under their belt. I've said my piece on the overall boss design, but aside from that, I'm very encouraged because these changes are easy fixes for the next title. Balancing will come with experience, like I said, and if this is all I have to say negatively about Lies of P, we're in good shape here. At the end of it all, I look at Lies of P and I am absolutely floored. For a developer such as NeoWiz, who doesn't have many notable titles to their name, to come in and create a game that is very difficult to pull off correctly, and to have this much success with it on your first attempt, is nothing short of remarkable. They have created a situation where now, with the steampunk setting, the ball is in From Software's court. If they do venture into the steampunk aesthetic, how will it compare to Lies of P? Now, I'm sure From will make a re ridiculous world with amazing boss fights and cool mechanics, but the fact that I can even think of making that comparison now just speaks to the work that Neo was put into this game. And after seeing the end credit scene, whew, I am stoked for what they got planned next. Lies of P is truly an amazing experience. You should play it right now, and it gets a 9 out of 10. So thank you guys so much for watching. What do you think of Lies of P? Do you think the same as me? Do you think differently than me? Either way, let me know below because I am a madman and I do read the comments. Other than that, most importantly, drop a like on the video and smash that subscribe button for the ZD boy who gives you reviews this damn good. All right, everybody. Once again, thank you so much and I'll see you all next time.